Welcome to this week's episode of Coffee with the Journalist, brought to you by One Pitch. The guests on our show include some of the most notable journalists from the top U.S.-based publications who cover topics including technology, lifestyle and culture, health, science, and consumer products. We discuss their role, the types of stories they cover, what their inbox looks like, and how they connect with sources. Brian Walsh, Axios' future correspondent, joins us on the show today. Brian joined Axios in February of 2020 and covers emerging technology and the trends shaping geopolitics, work, warfare, and more. Additionally, he writes the twice-weekly Axios Future newsletter. Brian has been a reporter and writer since 2001 when he started at Time Magazine. He helped launch 101 Medium and is the author of End Times, A Brief Guide to the End of the World, available on Amazon. Today, Brian shares in detail about the types of stories he writes for Axios, his bi-weekly newsletter and how he weaves pitches and sources into them, his experience reporting at time which led him to write his book, and more. Let's hear more from Brian now. Hey everyone, welcome to Coffee with the Journalist. We are in season two here today and I am super excited because today we have on Brian Walsh from Axios, who also is an author, which we will talk about because we have that wonderful part about what are you reading right now? Brian, welcome to Coffee with the Journalist. Thank you for being here. Great to be here, too. Are you drinking coffee? What are you drinking right now? I am actually drinking coffee. I thought it would be best to stay in the spirit. Me, too. Yes. It's very rare that myself and the other person are drinking coffee at all. So, yay. Keeping up with the theme here. It's early in the morning a little bit when we're doing this. So, that's excellent. Okay. Brian, we want to, of course, dive into your inbox. Now, you've been in Axios since February of 2020, so it's not like you've been on that beat for a long time like you were at time. Mm -hmm. But how crazy is your inbox with pitches? It's pretty crazy, I'd say. You know, I mean, what I do is look at emerging tech, big emerging trends, and that means a lot of startups. You know, I mean, a lot of companies that are in this kind of space, whether it's AI, whether it's biotechnology, automation, what have you, telehealth, a lot of companies doing a lot of things, which means a lot of people reaching out to me with ideas, with CEOs who want to talk, announcements, things like that. So, you know, every day is kind of a element of triage to trying to figure out, okay, who can I respond to? Who, who do I want to respond to? You know, what am I working on where this might piece into uh, into that later? You know, so I do a newsletter twice a week and you add up that up. That's like, uh-huh. you know, eight or nine pieces all together w- between those two. So that's a lot of yeah. people I need to talk to. Um, and so I'm often open to speaking to people, even if I don't automatically have something in mind, because I know it could be something that could then be stored for later use or to add to a trend or, or so forth. Cause you always need, you know, three makes a trend. So you always need to get that third person as well. Exactly. So do you cleanse your inbox in any way, shape or form, or do you like let it ride? Do you save things in a folder of any sort pitch wise? No, I'm a pretty bad organizer when it comes to, to email. You know, I kind of okay. depend on, on search. Uh, maybe I'll star things, favorite things. I often move things into like an Evernote file. So I'll, I'll do that if it's something that can put them into slot them in the subject areas. But, mm. you know, I have to admit, like, especially since I joined Axios, the the size of those of that inbox has just been growing and growing. And then it'll, you know, I'll have to spend the day writing a piece, you know, writing the newsletter, that means things sort of pile up during that time. So, you know, one of my New Year's resolutions is to try to get a little bit more efficient, a little bit better at figuring out how I can put all this in my fingertips and not get so much anxiety when I look at the number on the Gmail app on my iPhone. Mm -hmm. Let us know if you figure that out. I bet every other journalist on here would want to know your secrets because no one's solved it yet. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Now, do you respond to pitches? I do. I mean, I I can't, I, I do not respond to every pitch. It's impossible. I imagine. Yeah. I mean, I pick and choose based off what sounds interesting, what happens to dovetail with what I was thinking about writing that week, because I, I work on a fairly short turnaround, like I'll, I'll sometimes have things working for longer periods of time. But in reality, when you're doing this twice a week, that's amounts to almost like 4000 words. Yeah, you know, it you kind of need to just sort of like, okay, what am I doing? What making sure there's something in the newsletter every two or three days. And so I sort of do focus on like, okay, I have a sense that there's something in the news, or there's something that's been piquing my interest, or I want to do something about the pandemic, or I want to do something about AI. Okay, then I take a look and see who's, you know, as part of among other things, when it comes to pitches, like, okay, who's been reaching out around different sectors, and then sort of select the ones I think will use or work for that, as well as just sometimes things that sound interesting, or I think could be useful down the line. Hmm. It's always great to have those introductory uh, conversations, because then you can that can lead both to 
maybe a story or even just someone that you can then sort of call on later on when you're looking for some support within a piece or a sort of a gut check or what have you. Mm-hmm. Or you're like supporting that trend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, precisely. Got it. So given the array of the stories you do cover, because it is about the future, which is all encompassing, you just did, for example, a piece on the end of uh, hopefully uh, mosquitoes, a biotech company, then you did a review of a book Mm -hmm. called the ministry for the future. So like wide range. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the newsletter that you have, how do you come up with the story to do given how vast your beat is? Yeah, I mean, it, it. Sometimes I have sort of things in mind that I just know I I just need to hit. I need to update. So there might be something where um, bigger, broader subject like where is synthetic biology right now, which is kind of a subset of, of biotech that involves synthesizing DNA, and coming up with cool new products. The thing you mentioned about the mosquitoes actually is a, a synthetic biology company. So they will actually figure out a way to create a, a new repellent that actually works with the bacteria in your skin and so forth. So oh. sometimes it's that. Sometimes I'm looking something off the news uh, because the pandemic had really, you know, overtaken so much of what I and everyone else writes about. So, mm-hmm. you know, if there's something happening in the news around, you know, the vaccine gets approved. Okay, well, that suddenly has generated interest in how these new kinds of vaccines are going to be made in the future. Have we reached a new threshold, a new turning point around how fast we can do this? Then I will want to do almost a news-driven story around that and look to see who can be talked to or wh- who's working in that space. And then at other times, it's just things that, you know, strike my fancy or, or stuff that I have a particular interest in, like, you know, in part because of the book, I'm very interested in like big, potentially dangerous technological catastrophes. So are those working in that space? So, you know, are you working in the space of, how one engineers germs and how that could go wrong or how to secure that or you know are you working in ai ethics and the question of how we better use those kind of technologies Mm -hmm. so things like that so it's like half and half news driven me less so than a lot of my colleagues at axios who uh, you know whether doing business doing politics that's a very news news driven cycle i have the luxury and also sometimes the (laughs) burden because i have to generate it myself of trying just all right pick a trend out of the the general stream that is the future and decide okay what do i want to write about uh, this moment, knowing that, you know, there's gonna be another one in two or three days. Yeah. Oof. That's a lot to keep up with. Yeah, it is. Uh-huh. That's a lot. Now, do you at all leisurely read anything of any sort related to the future? Or are you like, oh, no, I just do like classical nonfiction, because I can only handle like, <laughs> I have to go far away from my beat. What is kind of your collective of reading material look like? Yeah, no, for book wise, it's kind of split between two. I like to sort of like half my time be spent on just things I like that I that I just want to read that's often fiction. Mm-hmm. And then the other half is kind of spent on trying to catch up and come up to speed in the various subjects that I'm working on. So, you know, I'm one of those people like I can only do one book at a time. I can't really do two books. So I'll sort of read between them one novel and then one nonfiction book. And then, you know, a lot of the time is spent for, you know, magazines, you know, all the all the ones you'd expect, The New Yorker, but like The Atlantic, then also closer to what I write about, ones like MIT Tech Review are, are really great. But a lot of that I'm consuming online. And honestly, a lot of it comes yeah. via newsletters. Like, I, I don't mean to be a newsletter shill who writes a newsletter, but like, that is, you know, become the most efficient way I've, I've found to get links, to get story ideas, to get smart commentary, and it just comes to you and you know when it comes to you. I mean, that to me is part of the reason why newsletters have been successful in recent years is that it's a, it's actually a pretty good way to winnow down what would otherwise be the gigantic fire hose of, of content being being shot at you all the time. So that's a lot of times just trying to catch up with that, put stuff in the pocket app, hopefully get around to it, slot it into the various folders I have for different subject matters. But, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's, I wish I could read more for pleasure, but like everyone else, it's, it's a little bit of a struggle. And it seems so luxurious, doesn't it? Of like, oh, let me, let me, at least for me now at this point, I'm not even a journalist, but like, oh, let me spend an hour reading a book, an actual, I mean, it just seems like the most la di da thing of that I could possibly do. Um, but I, I want to do it more. It just, I've never thought of equating it to like a luxury. And in a way it's, it really is of like sitting down with a book in hand and just enjoying it. Right. Cause it requires sort of uninterrupted time and, and solitude, two things of which are hard to find these days. It's quite true. Okay. Now, you were one of the rare journalists we've had on here who also has a book. So your book, End of Times, A Brief Guide to the End of the World, which came out in 2019. So interesting timing by you. And I want to hear a little bit about that because one, people, of course, can get it. That's great. But 
what spurred you to do this book? Was it your experience at Time, for example, Time Magazine? Yeah, a lot of it was the the experience at Time. So I worked at Time basically from when I left college for 15 years, started as a foreign correspondent, well, started as an intern, then became a foreign correspondent in in Hong Kong and Tokyo, and then wrote about the environment a lot back here in in New York, where I am now. And so, you know, what I was focused on was climate change for a long time. Here's a big global megatrend that has potentially catastrophic consequences. So that was on my mind. But then I'd also written a lot about disease. You know, I'd covered the avian flu, if you remember that, back in 2005, 2004. I'd covered SARS before that in 2003. So, you know, the forgotten flu pandemic 2009. So that was on my mind, too, as as a subject. Then I started looking around and seeing that there had been, over the last decade or 15 years, this whole new academic discipline around this thing called existential risks. And these are dangers, threats that could go really, really badly for the human race, like either extinction or essentially something that looks like Mad Max after after the fall. So yeah, or uh... yeah, no. And, and, and once I yeah, exactly, or, or COVID. And so once I had sort of figured that out, I was leaving time just because I wanted to sort of switch to writing more. And I thought this would be a fascinating book to write about. Let's, let's look at the big ways both natural and, and human made the world could end. What can be done about them? And that's what I spent essentially, you know, 2017, 2018, researching, writing, and then the the book came out. You know, and then of course following year there's a pandemic. So, you know, the timing was uh, was was good in the sense, I suppose, that it was before that. Um, I'm not sure if it would have been helped if it had come out at the exact same time or that would have just been too, too on the head, I suppose. Oh, wow. So I asked you before we started getting on the, the recording here, but was there a spike in sales uh, in uh, COVID times? Yeah, there was another renewed spike. I mean, if, maybe if we put the disease and not and not asteroids on the cover, it would have done even better at that time. But, you know, there was like both in terms of people reading it, but also in terms of people reaching out to talk about this subject, especially in those early days, I think, when it was not fully clear. If we were going to make it, yeah. Exactly, yeah. You know, and it felt like the start of the movie. But definitely, though, I mean, I think a lot of lessons are, are applicable there because this is a big point I was trying to get at the book is that, it's very tough to prepare for these kind of risks because they've never been experienced before. You know, we haven't experienced a pandemic on this scale for a hundred years. And when you don't do that, mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to put the money in to, to, to prepare, even though what we've seen very clearly here, I mean, this is going to end up costing us beyond the terrible loss of human life, trillions upon trillions of dollars. And we could have averted it for far, far less, but it's just not something we do. Hopefully that we'll learn that lesson this time. We tend not to, we tend to sort of get shocked and then forget. But I am hoping at least around this particular subject, we'll be smart enough. And technology is helping us there too, to ensure that something like this won't happen, or if it does happen again, won't be as bad as this one's been. Mm -hmm. I was just talking with a friend on that of, man, how do you get your war chest going with disease? And how do you get, I mean, uh, this has to be a conversation multiple people are having, but you know, how cool could it be if like, oh yeah, oh, new thing. Yeah, we got a vaccine in a month, you know, whatever. Now, I don't know, you know, if that could be done, but with maybe with AI. Yeah. Well, what's really fascinating is that we we had, we actually had this vaccine, uh, like the Moderna and the Pfizer ones, the new ones, the first ones, essentially in finished form very quickly after the virus was discovered in sequence. The rest was a matter of the clinical trials, what had to happen, safety, efficacy, and so forth. But this new technology, one of the most exciting new technologies we have out there, this ability to use mRNA that to quickly sequence a virus and then actually figure out what is it about it you can actually attack and what can you use for a vaccine, that could potentially create a situation down the line where we can do this way faster. Way faster, right? You know, or even get a, get ahead of it and begin to sort of design ready-made, almost like keeping a sort of artillery in, in reserve. Mm-hmm. Vaccines that can sort of adjust to any number of potential virus families out there. And there's going to be more. Oh, yeah. So hopefully this will be a, a turning point, you know, that, that we can do this. This is the one thing we did really well in this uh, pandemic in the U.S. Pretty much everything else, not so great. Uh, but in this case, I think that could really point the way towards a much safer future, uh, which is one of the nice sides of the stuff I read about. Uh, oh, fascinating. Today's interview will continue after this brief message brought to you by OnePitch. Are you curious to see the unique ways OnePitch helps PR professionals and marketers pitch journalists? Head to OnePitch.co to learn about our new OnePitch score and see how easy it is to find the right journalist to pitch your news to. Sign up for your free account today. Now, back to today's episode. Okay. All right, we got a little word association. So I'm going to give you word and you tell me first thing that comes to mind and we'll see what we get. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, food. 
Tacos. I plus one that. Drink. Beer. Hobby. Reading. God, it's so boring. Yes. No, it's great. The luxury. The luxury of that. I, I'm down with that. Biotech. Moderna. AI. Apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Climate change. Al Gore. Robots. Revolution. VR. Overhyped. Extinction. Agenda. Agenda? Did you say agenda? Yeah, I don't know why. That's right. <laughs> okay, journalism. Uh, reporters. Pitch. Inbox. Oh, the next one is inbox. Okay, inbox. I guess pitch. Uh, anxiety, I was going to say. <laughs> anxiety. Hey, that's good. Yeah, a lot of people um, have a feeling on that last one there. So, yeah. Okay. Speaking of journalism, how do you feel the future of journalism is? Uh, you know, it's, it's challenging. I'll say, yeah, I mean, I've, uh, I'm coming up this summer, 20 years as a professional in this business, which is mind blowing to me. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I've been fortunate, I've been fortunate enough just to be doing this work for so long. Um, and to do it both in a big sort of older mainstream place like time magazine where I started my career. And now more recently at a really vibrant, viable startup in Axios, that's, that's rethinking, so much of how we approach and write the news, which I think is really great. I mean, so much of how we used to write had to do with, you know, technology that 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 was sort of sent, that was put in place decades ago. Like, how long should a story be? That was because of certain page length and, and column length within newspapers. You know, so we're, we're challenging that, saying we don't have to do that. So that's exciting. And I think the energy around that space is exciting. But, you know, there's no getting around the fact that the financial side and the business side is really really challenging, you know, and th the reality is you are competing anytime you're doing anything, um, in, in media more, more broadly against every other possible place, the eyeballs of the reader you're trying to reach could be looking at, you know, whether that's Netflix or whether that's a different media brand or whether that's a TikTok or whether that's a video game or whatever. So that's a lot of competition. Um, and the nature of social media is it's kind of a, a they sure the internet, I think is it's a very winner take all platform, which means, you know, that's actually good for consumers in the sense of what they're getting, what, you know, the access you're able to get that just wasn't possible 30 years ago. But that's going to be tough for the viability of a lot of people within this business. And I do worry about certain areas like local news, which is just very tough. I mean, it, you know, it's there's a reason why so much of the media we're doing now is focused on national or even international issues because you can maximize the reach. But maybe only people in Pittsburgh are really interested in Pittsburgh news, and that's not a huge market. But on the plus side, you know, Axios is actually experimenting and launching a whole bunch of local newsletters who really think um, in, in sort of medium-sized cities and really hope that, that could be something that could roll out further and really make a difference around that that dearth of local news we're seeing. So, uh, you know, like a lot of things I read about when it comes to the future, I can see a lot of optimism, a lot of hope around technology, a lot of potential for a better experience, but also a lot of headwinds in terms of who's really going to win and what that will look like, especially for those of us who are actually doing it, you know? Yes. Who, I always am interested speaking with people who've been now at the, you know, in the, in the decade plus of the industry versus folks I have on here who maybe have like three or four years and, you know, cause they were like just there in school uh, with it and maybe had some internships and stuff, but it's different when it's, it's the 20 plus year people considering the macro environment. By the way, is that what spurred you to go to Axios, leaving such a time honored, traditional, big behemoth like time? Yeah, I mean, that's ultimately, yeah, that was a big part of it. I mean, seeing their success at, at such a such a young age, seeing like the creativity and the track record of those who were making it, that really did motivate me. You know, I, 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 wanted, to work, I, would, I wanted to work at a place that I thought could be successful, that had been successful, and it's been completely the, what I expected since I've joined. Mm, excellent. That's good to hear and exciting. It sounds like wonderful. Well, Brian, now we have the Mad Lib. We'll see how on point it is, how accurate, or if it's just plain silly, totally fine either way, but let's see what, what happens if you're down for it. Sure. Are you ready? Here we go. So first thing is just a catchphrase, any catchphrase. Eat my shorts. I guess it's the Simpsons early. Eat my shorts. Love it. I, that's the first time I heard that one. Okay. What's a scare phrase you would hear in journalism? I have a few notes on this story. Mm, I have a few notes. 
yes. Okay. What about an empowering thing you might hear or a positive thing you might hear? Uh, you can get twice as much space. You can get twice as much space. Okay. An adjective. Excellent. A part of a pitch. Innovative. Okay. What about another adjective? Concise. And then another part of a pitch. Groundbreaking. Okay. Uh, An amount of time. 30 minutes. An adjective. Delayed. A noun. A singular noun. Paragraph. Okay. And then what about a topic? Any topic? Artificial intelligence. A verb ending in ing. Ringing. And then what about just a verb, any verb? Male. Male. Okay. Okay. That was pretty fast. Let's read it back. Brian, here we go. To me, tech journalism is eat my shorts. It consists of, I have a few notes on that story, and you can get twice as much space on the daily. If a pitch has an excellent part of an innovation, I will absolutely respond to it. However, if a pitch has a concise mention of something groundbreaking, you can expect no reply from me. If 30 minutes goes by and you don't see an email back from me, you can just assume I am delayed about it. The best stories have a paragraph and are usually about AI. And the best way to reach me is to ring me, but you can also just mail it to me. Wow, Brian, that's actually somewhat makes sense. It actually made sense. Yeah. <laughs> it made sense. Some of these do not at all in any way, shape, or form. So this was refreshing. Thank you for playing and thank you for being on today. This was a lot of fun. Me too. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Happy, by the way, happy holidays. I know we're, we're, this is debuting later in 2021, but it's in December right now. Brian, we appreciate it and way to survive this year. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Coffee with the Journalist featuring Brian Walsh from Axios. If you enjoy listening to our show, make sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you have a moment, please leave us a review to share your thoughts about the show and today's guests. To learn more about the latest tools on OnePitch, head to our website at onepitch.co. We'll see you all next week with a brand new guest and even more insights about the journalists you want to learn more about. Until then, start great stories.